In retrospect, I thought starting a new research institute, policy focused inside a great university, was a good idea because I didn't know how hard it would be. Mark. Great. Is there a right way to and wrong way to do this? Meeting, take two. Take one marker. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for being here. I'm Jason Bordoff. I am the founding director of the Center on Global Energy Policy at Columbia University. I still remember my first day at Columbia. It was me and one brilliant young guy, Jesse McCormick, and we walked into the ninth floor of the School of International and Public Affairs and were handed the keys to two offices. And the question was, how do we start building something and what does that look like? The motivation for it was really trying to create what I, as a policy maker, wished there was more of when I was sitting in my job in the White House. And we had policy decisions that we had to make, usually on pretty short time frames and not always feeling like we had all the information we needed. Who could we turn to that would help us understand the geopolitical, the economic, the environmental implications? Jason said, I've just been hired by Columbia University to start a center on global energy policy, would you consider coming to New York? I'm David Sandel. I'm the inaugural fellow here. Jason asked me to come here for a year, 10 years ago, uh, and it worked out pretty well. <laughs> One event that sticks in my mind very clearly is the uh, launch of the center. Michael Bloomberg spoke. He was mayor of New York at the time. Uh, Jason, uh, congratulations on the launch of this exciting new center of global energy policy. I remember thinking this, this really has potential. It, it underscored Columbia University's convening capability. It underscored Jason's great ability to bring people together. And, and I think the center has grown you know, ever, ever since. But I think about the priorities for 2023, our 10th anniversary year. We've made a lot of progress, and it's largely because of people who have supported us from the very beginning. Come on, Jason, let's get going. <laughs> okay. Dan Jurgen is probably the preeminent energy historian of the last half century, and he really became uh, an important mentor and friend who's been uh, a really valuable source of counsel to me in my career. Trust is, is not something that is given to you. It's something that you earn by the quality of your research. And that's why the center has really become a go-to place for real insight into the energy and climate questions that are so crucial. Yeah, I mean, I saw that firsthand, I think, in government when you're sort of have, everyone kind of is coming in with an agenda. And the question right. is, who doesn't have an agenda well, and I can I, trust? I, no, I think actually the center does have an agenda. And the agenda is to do really high quality research that is impactful, meaningful, and stands up, stands the test of time. Yeah. Nice to see you. Thank you for making time. Yeah. On a personal level, <laughs> Fatih Barol has been a friend and uh, a mentor and a colleague for a very long time. You may be best known uh, globally for, you know, repeatedly saying that investment in new oil and gas is inconsistent with our climate goals. I think, first of all, we have to decide, are we really a taking 1.5 degrees Celsius target seriously. So the solution in my view, if we want to keep the planet uh, more or less as it is now, we have to make a huge increase in clean energy investments. Last year, global energy investments for fossil fuels was about 1 trillion, and for clean energy investments about 1.4 trillion. This needs to be in 2050, one for fossil fuels and nine for clean energy investments. Part of the reason Fatih is so focused on 1.5 degrees is it is a goal and a target that emerges from science. And at Columbia University, we have hundreds of the best climate scientists in the world. It's not an arbitrary goal. I spoke to several universities before deciding to join Columbia. And a big reason for that is President Lee Bollinger. Excuse me, if you take one marker. Thanks for making time for it. Sure. President Bollinger has been a really visionary leader. And in Lee's view, great universities, with the amounts of capital they have, can't maintain their social license to operate in the 21st century unless they are also deeply focused on solving humanity's greatest challenges. Energy, something so central to civilization, to the planet, should have much more attention in the scholarly community, but it hasn't. The question, though, is in between politicization of a university and doing nothing but scholarship, is there lots of room for engagement with the world? And my clear answer to that is absolutely. Good to see everyone again. 
this is exciting. This is the first of the monthly luncheons that we're gonna hold with the Global Energy Fellows to give all of you a structured way to interact with the extraordinary people that we're lucky to bring into the Columbia community. Mary's a legend in environmental and climate policy making. So please join me in welcoming Mary Nichols. Thank you. I just want to say that just listening to the backgrounds of the people in this room and the things that you've worked on and are working on, I feel like we could take over the world, and I think we should. <laughs> they took this year and this program to really bring students into the fold, to learn, to discuss amongst ourselves as well. It's something I really admire, and I think it's going to be really fruitful and valuable. The whole energy system, it is so large, it's so hard to move. You can see a lot of progress and yet we're barely making a dent in the climate problem and that can be depressing. And then you sit and see how brilliant and passionate uh, and, and the diverse perspectives that a group of students uh, like you have, it really does offer hope and inspiration that we're gonna make a lot of uh, progress. Educating the next generation of energy and climate leaders is a big part of what we do, but it's not the only thing we do. Megan O'Sullivan, a former Deputy National Security Advisor, has been my main collaborator for several years. A lot of the work that the Energy Center does shows up in its pages and publications, but a lot of it doesn't. A lot of it's behind the scenes. There's a lot of interaction between the Energy Center with people in Washington who are grappling with real problems. They'll reach out to say, hey, can you give us some ideas? How do you see this? This is absolutely critical for policymakers to be able to pick up the phone and do that. This is a, a place where the Energy Center really, really, really bats uh, uh, above its weight. Damalola, thanks for joining me virtually. How's everything in London? Damalola is a brilliant woman from Nigeria who now leads Sustainable Energy for All, the United Nations effort to expand access to sustainable energy for the billions of people around the world who use almost no energy at all. She's also, I'm proud to say, on the advisory board of the Center on Global Energy Policy. Countries, they, they do want to truly develop. They want to industrialize. And they would like to be part of the clean energy transition um, for the, for the first time. So we really have to work together because what we're having is that at least most of the victims to, to the climate crisis actually are in the global south. And it isn't okay for a million women to be dying every year because they have no access to clean fuels. As a woman of color, that has been, that's been quite difficult to wrap my head around. And it's kind of made it my mission that this cannot be acceptable. And I think that's the beauty of our collaboration, right? It's not releasing papers or just articles for articles sake. Our work is about how do you create something that transforms policy, or more importantly, make sure no one is left behind. Our aspiration is that nobody who's a leader in the energy and climate space, policy or otherwise, would want to make an important decision without knowing what we think. Russia has launched a military assault on Ukraine. Missile attacks have left energy infrastructure and the health system in tatters. When Russia invaded Ukraine, policymakers turned to us. You know, other than my staff, who was the first people I called when I heard that Putin invaded, you were the first people that I called. Senator Michael Bennett and his team have reached out on many occasions for advice and insights. He's a policymaker who really is trying to get the best evidence and analysis, and that's, that's who our target audience is. I knew you would have a perspective on what this was going to mean to Europe in the short term and what the United States could do to help, uh, in this case, keep Europe in the fight against Putin and in support of Ukraine. And the center, I think, had an incredibly useful perspective on that. Thank you for your time. Very generous. The big part of what we do is try to figure out how to see all sides of the climate and energy challenge we face and hopefully provide some analysis that helps to improve the prospects of bipartisan cooperation. Thank you for making time to be with us. I really appreciate it. Good to be with you, Jason. Senator Whitehouse has been a leader on climate change in a way that, you know, not many other senators have. You've spoken about how bipartisanship is possible and how Republicans come to you privately and yeah. say, we care about climate change and we want to work together. Yeah. How does the work we do help facilitate things like that happening? There are plenty of Republicans in the Senate who are very evidence-based, and the more that they see 
information from trusted sources like yours, the more that presses them to see how they can find a way around the fossil fuel industry's blockade and try to come to some agreement. Take one marker. Brett Stevens is a columnist at the New York Times, a conservative columnist, has been a friend for many years, and he's one whose thinking on climate has evolved in part through some of the work and discussions we've had together. I wrote a notorious, maybe infamous first column in the New York Times, which was about climate change. There was enormous blowback, uh, efforts to have me uh, fired, uh, sort of... People canceling petitions. their subscriptions. It caused a huge stir. And one of the few people who actually came to me in um, a thoughtful and respectful way was you. You said, you know, instead of demanding that this guy be fired, why don't I put together experts in a variety of climate-related fields, get them in a room at Columbia with Brett and have a conversation. And it's a wonderful way to actually engage a critic. The question of climate is inherently a conservative issue because it's really about not us, but your grandchildren. So if conservatives claim to be worried about, say, the solvency of Social Security or Medicare or the United States uh, government, they should also care about long-term impacts on future uh, generations. This is GPS. I'm Fareed Zakaria coming to you live from New York. Today on the program... Fareed Zakaria is brilliant. He comes from a world of ideas and scholarship, so he knows how important good research and thought leadership is to helping us understand what's happening in the world. Are you guys ready? Very intimidating to interview Fareed Zakaria. It's like, you're the master. I remember talking to you early on to help try to provide some insight into what role energy was playing in this crisis. The Russian invasion of Ukraine, in a way, symbolizes everything that we have gotten wrong and that we need to get right about energy. In trying to figure that out, I told my team to reach out to you because you have managed to thread this needle between uh, being honest, being, being thoughtful, and yet trying to make sure that you are getting the analysis right, no matter where it lands you politically. We wanted to go through the biggest impacts we've seen from the team this year and what we think we should be setting up for the next year. I'm really proud of the team that we have and humbled uh, regularly by looking around the table at the people who could be doing anything because they are the very best at what they do. These are extraordinarily talented people and the fact that they choose to make their professional home an institute that I created is, is really humbling. <laughs>